Open up to the book of Philippians. I'll be reading Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Philippians 2, 1 through 4. And so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, then complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. The word of the Lord. Father, I I beg that you work in us, your people, your children. Lord Jesus, your sheep, cause the profundity of the theology that is here to live. live in us to work even significantly in the next 45 minutes in us that will show fruit in our feeble lives and do it as it is your pleasure to your glory amen We are called not only to see the beauty of the gospel of Christ and find a a joy that is otherworldly and beyond anything attainable from the natural. We're called not only to find our peace and comfort in the gospel of Jesus, but by definition of that, we are called to take that and overflow it to others and first and foremost to one another in the body of Christ. Let me start this morning with an illustration of our text and then we'll go to it. The, and I I don't use this word lightly, I think he is a great New Testament scholar of our day, D.A. Carson. He wrote this a number of years ago. Several years ago, I was asked to interview Dr. Carl F.H. Henry and Dr. Kenneth Cancer for a videotaping. These two American theologians have been at the heart of much of the evangelical renaissance in the Western world, especially but not exclusively in America, referring to the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Each was about 80 years of age at the time of the videotaping. One has written many books. The other brought to birth and nurtured one of the most influential seminaries in the Western world. Toward the end of that discussion, I asked them a question, more or less in these terms. You two men have been extraordinarily influential for almost half a century. So without wanting to indulge in cheap flattery, I must say that what is attractive about your ministries is that you have retained integrity. Both of you are strong, yet neither of you is egotistical. You have not succumbed to the eccentricity in doctrine, nor to individualistic empire-building In God's good grace, what has been instrumental in preserving you in these areas? Both of them spluttered in deep embarrassment. 
And then one of them ventured with a kind of gentle outrage. How on earth can anyone be arrogant when standing beside the cross? What is crystal clear in our text is that Paul appeals to the Philippians' vertical experience with God through Jesus Christ. And he says to them, take that and love and prefer one another. The argument of Philippians 2 verses 1 to 4 goes like this. If it's true of you, or in other words, really, since you have experienced such incredible, important, life-changing joy in you through the gospel of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, therefore, you must act in such and such a way. Namely, overflowing that treasure unto fellow believers. And so first, the foundation is right there. In verse 1, he appeals to their and thus our, we who are Christians, he appeals to our Christian experience. And notice in the text, in verse 1, his appeal to their experience is given with four if clauses. Now, I know the ESV only uses one if, and then it puts all the clauses behind it. It means the same thing, but in the Greek, the if word, a, is there four times, which is a first-class condition, which, in a sense, I say, look, if you're a Christian, then do such and such, which usually means, I'm assuming you are, since you, since this is true of you. And so Paul says, since these experiences are true, then make my joy by living this way. Let's look at it. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, what does that mean? It means from your union with Jesus, which means because you're called to Him to be saved and you believe in Him, that encourages me. How can one possibly be born again and not have an otherworldly, deep-seated experience of being encouraged of that reality in Christ? If or since there is comfort of love that you have. What does he mean, comfort of love? He means the comfort you derive from Christ loving you. The love of Christ towards you. And the comfort that brings. If there is any participation in the Spirit, literally, if there's any koinonia, uh, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, meaning since you have an intimate relationship with God, the Holy Spirit who dwells within you. If, or since it's true, believer, that you have affection and sympathy, not meaning here you have affection and sympathy for others, but you are the recipient of, of God's affection. And the word translated sympathy is normally translated mercy. Since you are experiencing God's heart of mercy toward you, that's the foundation of what he's going to now. Tell them and us how to live. Let me just summarize again verse 1 by paraphrasing it. Paul is writing to us 
If being Christians has brought you any encouragement, if there is any comfort in times of pain and loneliness, you know, having come to you as you bask in the assurance of God's love for you in Christ, If you have the very person of the Holy Spirit living in you, and thus creating a deep sense of comfort and and of family with others who are also fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit, if you are having any fresh experiences of tenderness and mercy from God, get it? Then, verse 2. If that's true, verse 2. Verse 2 is, because of verse 1, therefore, complete my joy by living this way. This is Paul's indirect way of saying, take the vertical of verse 1 and lay it out horizontally toward each other. Complete my joy by being of the same mind. That's the main thing he says. And then the rest of it here, he unfolds what he means by the same mind. First, by having the same love. Meaning the same love. For one another, when he puts same, he's drawing back to verse 1. The comfort that you get from Christ loving you. Take that same love and spill it over onto each other. Secondly, by being in full accord. Literally, the the Greek, it is being one-souled. Be one soul. In other words, unity. In other words, as opposed to division and divisiveness, as you're sharing in the Holy Spirit. So work on walking together as one soul. By being of one mind, literally, thinking the same thing. I just think he's got to be meaning when it comes to to you as believers in unity and in, in, in the church, just have that one purpose. We have a lots of diversity and personality and interest, but when it comes to the core, one purpose. And in case Paul hasn't been clear, he he, he spells it out more in verses three and four. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. So he says, don't. Act toward one another with with, with an attitude of rivalry and competition or selfish ambition or conceit, which literally in the Greek is vain or empty glory. And I don't think that's an accident with Paul. This whole letter is about glory. It's about God's glory. Greek word for glory is doxa. The word he uses here, don't don't be this, act out in keno doxa, empty glory. In 111, Paul writes, you be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. In chapter 2, verse 11, And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In chapter 4, verse 20, To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. And in chapter 3, verse 19, The opposite of walking according to the truth 
of the gospel, Paul says, is to, to put your glory in shameful, worldly, earthly things. Quote, Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame. So now he said, do nothing from empty, hollow, deceptive, vain glory or conceit. That's a good word. Don't be conceited in your relations. Literally, this stands in stark contrast to the purpose of the gospel, which is the glory of God. It is utterly inconsistent when we do that. In the body of Christ. But instead, he says, in humility, in humility, count others more significant than you consider yourself. Treat all brothers and sisters in this way, no matter their status in society. That's what he's driving at. He's talking to slave owners. And he's talking to slaves. He's talking to doctors. And he's talking to day laborers. He's talking to rich. He's talking to poor. They weren't utterly considered with skin color like we are now. Doesn't matter. And he says it's called humility. It's in stark contrast to the word vainglory. And finally, verse 4. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. It's just a rephrasing, isn't it, of the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians 10, 24, let no one seek his own good. doesn't mean you don't seek your good. You want to eat. You want to stay alive. Okay, you don't like pain. He means only. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Again, the golden rule. In Romans 12, 16, he writes, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty arrogant but associate with the lowly never be wise in your own sight Paul he is calling the church not to disqualify ever any fellow believer on the ground of anything any social status any ethnicity, any IQ level, any color of skin, but rather show true humility by regarding others just as important and as valuable in the body of Christ as you may deem that you are. Okay. So what? what? What is this to love each other with affection, with mercy, to treat each other is better than you would treat yourself in that context. To, to not walk with one another with pride or competition, arrogance or an attitude of superiority over others. Well, what he lays out here from the text is clearly not just acts, actions, external doings, but it includes internal growth, motivations, heartfelt dispositions. How do you have, according to the text, the same love? Meaning, the love Christ has for you work on having the same 
I'm going to tell you, Jesus doesn't just act. He feels real, saving love for each and every sheep. How would you have the same love? How do you have this honoring the other is more significant than yourself? Just for a moment, for a minute or two, I'm going to turn to Romans 12. And Paul writes this to the church of Rome, verses 9 and 10. Let love be genuine. No reason to ever write that unless there's a possibility of some kind of love that's really not genuine. Let love be real, genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Christianly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Make a game of it, he says. Play with each other about it. See who can win the competition of honoring the other. So there's two things going on there in this Romans text. Deep affection, brotherly affection, and showing honor to the other. He Paul does not want us to just say, okay, I'll decide to, to, to honor other Christians is more significant than myself and the, the way I act and not care about what's going on when no one can see in my heart. You can honor another person outwardly. There's ways to do that. And we should. But we can do that without love. We can do it without affection for him or for her. Paul doesn't want us to choose between the two. He's saying do both. They go hand in glove. This is part of what sanctification is. It's God working on our dark and selfish, hard hearts. But he's doing that from the ground of you are justified. You're in Christ. And this is the whole foundation. That's why God's love just keeps flowing toward us. In verse 1. And so some honoring, right, is get real with life. It means treating people better than they deserve. My wife is good at this. Notice she says here in Romans, outdo. Outdo one another in showing honor. Compared to the way Paul says it in our text, in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. I think that means at its root, prefer to honor rather than be honored. Got a choice? Do I want to more be honored right in this situation? Or would I prefer to honor the other? He says, make a game of it. Like my wife and I for years ago, and it's been very, it was very helpful. Most marriages can't do it. We would make a game of correcting each other grammatically in oral speech without getting offended. God was gracious. Make a game of it. You'll grow in it. So I want you to turn for a second to James, the book of James. Very familiar text. I'm just going to let the word of the Lord speak to us. It's the same line of what Paul is talking about. Chapter 2, verse 1. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For, for if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, 
And if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place. While you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit at my feet. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? which He has promised to those who love Him. And so in our passage, Paul decides here to use an example. (laughs) And he, he puts in this context of Romans 2 the highest possible example there could be. Let's read it. I'll begin in in the middle of verse 4. Each, let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And here he goes. Who, though he was in the form of God, He did not count his equality with God. A thing to be grasped. He did not refuse to stoop and become incarnate in Mary's womb. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. There is no greater example of humility, of looking to the interests the good of others. For us and for our salvation, he went to the cross. And Paul says, have this attitude. Now, why would that be important? I mean, to the core of Christianity. Look, justification by faith alone and getting clear on the essence of that gospel doctrine. God's sovereignty, His divine election. So many beautiful things He shows us of Himself, of truth. So why would this be important? Why does Paul here, actually, let's just say truly then, why does God, through Paul, make a big deal about how Christians treat one another? A few reasons. First, God commands us to have loving affections, to show honor, Walk in humility toward one another because that is what shows the reality of our new nature in Christ. Okay, that's right there. That is the text. If we read it for its meaning, that's the text. That's what verse 1 is there for. To flow into verses 2 to 4. First, So if there's any encouragement in Christ that you have, any comfort from His love, any fellowship with the Holy Spirit in your life, any affection and sympathy that you're experiencing, now, 
Let that become visible to the way you treat others. That's God's theology of the church. These are behaviors in one sense. Okay, listen to this. That are natural and fitting to those who are actually born again. That's why it's important. Do not draw an unbiblical conclusion from what I just said. Like, well, if they're natural, like fruit grows on a tree, well, then you don't need to command me to do that. That would be like saying, I have a fruit tree in my backyard, and I can't, I don't know why there's no fruit on it living in Southern California. Do you ever water it? No. It's natural. Okay. Oh, yeah, there, there's a reality, and there will be fruit in every single born again person. And one of the means is God's watering through his commands to us. Having, he says, the same love, affection, it's natural because the new birth means we're all born into the same family by the same spirit with one father. And that was the core of the Apostle John's theology. This is how John writes it in 1 John 5, 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of the Father. In other words, he says, love for the Father shows itself in love for other children of the Father. Affection for God by the fellowship of the Holy Spirit brings affection for others who are of that same spirit, that same gospel, that same one true faith. We will spend all of us throughout the centuries who have been born again through the gospel of Christ will spend eternity together in the best possible relationships. And there will be, thank goodness, no temptation for rivalry then. There will be no temptation for selfish ambition then there'll be no temptation for conceitedness or vain glory or thinking of yourself as superior then. But God has left us here now with all of those temptations and to shine through the darkness even of our own hearts. Glimmers of the truth of Christ down here now. God commands us to live in the light of the family in the future now I mean this is the flow of, of, of the New Testament there's the indicative mood you are saved God saved you you are in Christ you have been justified by faith statements of fact that flow into the imperative mood therefore do therefore go therefore Act. That's the flow of the New Testament. And that family reality is based not just in some exterior thing. This is why the church, is, is all the time people flock into the church of Christ on earth without actually being born of the Spirit. Time shows it. But this is why those who are, it is based in verse 1. If there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from His love, any fellowship of the Spirit, any affection and mercy that you're experiencing from God. Now let's assume the answer is true for me. 
He did save me. I'm real. Or you. Think about it. How is that true? None of us deserved any of those experiences that we get to experience. You don't deserve this encouragement in Christ. You don't deserve his love that brings you such comfort. And the fellowship of the Spirit dwelling in you and his affection toward you, all of us are utterly, in and of ourselves, dishonorable before God. And yet, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For Paul, the issue is finally one of attitude. And the man who lived perfectly, the one human being who never sinned and lived with the perfectly right attitude, washed his disciples' feet. The act of of a slave. And that's why he is the model even in our context. Have Jesus' mindset, which is yours, in him. It's important because it reflects the truth. It's why Jesus said to his disciples, it is by your Love for one another. That's how they'll know you belong to me. Secondly, why is it important? God demands that we love, that we prefer each other, that we look out for each other. Because this strengthens and confirms the faith of those we love affectionately, that we deem significant in the body of Christ. If, if we're called to actually do acts of love, someone's got to be receiving it. And that's every one of us. Not only receptacles of this, particularly in times of need, but then depositing into others. When you're on the receiving end of love and being honored in the body of Christ, then you experience the confirmation that you're truly in the family. That's a good thing. Third, God demands this way of life because it displays the glory of Christ. Because it is the fruit of verse 1. Therefore, it is the portrait of his character. Paul says this in different words in Ephesians 4.32. Be kind to one another. Be tender-hearted, forgiving one another. And see, here's his theological logic. As God in Christ forgave you. He says, again, it's like verse 1 of our text. Just take it right there and read it backwards. God in Christ and in the gospel, what he did, forgave you. Therefore, forgive one another. Be tenderhearted towards one another. Be kind to one another. Our ability to love is rooted in God's tenderness and kindness and forgiveness toward us. When we become the servant and deem the other is better, more important, we're painting a picture of the way Jesus was among us in his earthly walk. And that's why Paul goes on to say in our text, have this mind, this attitude among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus. So finally then, how? How do we have the same mindset as Jesus, as, as, or as verse 1 
in Philippians 2. How do we have that toward a Christian we might not like? Or have a hard time liking? And yet I'm called to have affection, care, love. How do we honor is better or more significant those that were so conscious of them doing such dishonorable things? First, we need to know God commands this. That these attitudes that we are commanded to have, we need to know that they belong to the very nature of our newness in Christ as we sang about this morning. We need, in other words, to admit we cannot possibly do this. We cannot possibly feel what we're supposed to feel without God's enablement and therefore we need to pray daily earnestly regularly that God would do whatever he has to do to grow us and make us more into the kind of loving person honoring of other person that we're called to be secondly we need to preach to ourselves that other believers, no matter how imperfect they are, and that's what they say about you, too, that they are the children of God. Remind yourself that Christ shed blood was for them also, and that they're forgiven even of all those things that bug you and upset you about them. They're justified by faith alone also. And so don't believe that wonderful, glorious New Testament doctrine in just word and then deny it in your actions toward others. Yes, they do do didn't mean it that way. But they do, do bad things. Sinful things like you. Yes, they can be immature and annoying. But don't dishonor the blood of Jesus that covers all of that. In other words, let what you experience in chapter 2, verse 1, what you experience in Christ, grow in you toward them. Third, look in the hardest, particularly these are when we're struggling, look for evidences of grace in their flawed lives. Every real believer will have evidences of grace. And therefore, don't dishonor the work of God by only focusing and only complaining about their works of the flesh. Look for the evidences of grace. That is what is going to happen to every believer on the final judgment seat of Christ. When everything is open, all that sin will be clear. But the appeal of that attorney will be, he's mine, she's mine. How do I know? Let's look at some of the evidences of my grace in them. And all that is is to say, that means they're in me. 
Father. And then all of that sin has been covered. He will point to the evidences that you're truly born again, which is the fruit. Oh, it is never a perfect life, and it's mixed with toil and sweat and works of the flesh and sin. But think about it. I mean, if at this moment none of us are on our deathbed, but think about that. If I'm on my deathbed, it's, it's heaven, it's grace. Part of it is I'm praying right now, and I love you. That's what he's going to point to. And so... Do for each other what God will do for us. And finally, remember, you were under God's wrath. Without hope. And then, out of the blue, something happened. Then, there was encouragement in Christ. Then you were experiencing comfort from His love. Then you found yourself participating in and fellowshipping in and with the Holy Spirit. You were the recipient of affection, sympathy. You were undeserving. Of God's love and grace. But now it's yours. And that's the key. To true humility. Therefore. Because this is true of you. Have this same love towards each other. Therefore be in full of cord. With one purpose together. Therefore, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others as more significant than yourselves. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the gift of verse 1. The gift of your Son. That the gospel has come to our ears. And that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you gave us inner ears to hear and to experience. And that we rest upon this gospel and the truth of having been justified. And thus we have peace with you and you're at peace with us in Christ Jesus. And that now upon that great surety we hear text of scripture like this and have hope. Day by day of your work in us. Oh, may you allow each and every one of us to be a portrait to one extent or the other to the love of Christ for the church as it is expressed in our love for each other in this world. Thank you.